It's Friday, September 13th, and this is the Daily Medical News, where we bring you the top medical headlines of the day, plus an in-depth look at the day's biggest story. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Terry Rudd. Today, there are cautionary new recommendations on giving testosterone to postmenopausal women. The Trump administration plans to ban flavored e-cigarettes. Health insurers are set to pay a record number of rebates to patients. And N3 fatty acid supplements don't cut the risk of preterm delivery. Plus, new research highlights the roles clinicians, teachers, and parents can play in preventing suicide. What role, if any, does testosterone therapy have in postmenopausal women? New International Position Statement concludes that a trial of testosterone is appropriate for those with hypoactive sexual desire dysfunction. But beyond that, the evidence supports no use for any other condition, symptom, or reason. An international task force of experts from the Endocrine Society, the American College of Gynecologists and Obstetricians, and multiple other medical societies developed the seven-page statement. It's available in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. A link to that is available in the show notes. When testosterone is used, the experts emphasize that blood concentrations shouldn't exceed those seen in healthy young women. Dr. Margaret Weirman of the University of Colorado at Denver in Aurora represented the Endocrine Society on the task force. She says there's been growing concern about testosterone being prescribed for a variety of signs and symptoms without data to support its use. And there's significant concern about the ongoing lack of approved formulations licensed specifically for women. The FDA is finalizing a policy that will target flavored e-cigarettes and aim to clear the market of unauthorized, non-tobacco-flavored e-cigarette products. HHS Secretary Alex Azar says the federal government wants to reverse what he calls the deeply concerning epidemic of youth e-cigarette use. The announcement comes as the CDC and state health departments track hundreds of lung-related illnesses that are linked to the use of e-cigarettes. Details of the FDA's new regulatory action are still to come. According to federal rules, all electronic nicotine delivery system products must file pre-market tobacco product applications with the FDA within two years. The Trump administration says many such products on the market now aren't being legally marketed, and that makes them subject to government action. Federal officials note that preliminary numbers from the National Youth Tobacco Survey show a continued rise in youth e-cigarette use. More than a quarter of high school students in 2019 are current e-cigarette users. And health insurance companies are getting ready to pay back a record $1.3 billion in medical loss ratio rebates. That tally tops the previous rebate record of $1.1 billion issued back in 2012. That's according to an analysis by the Kaiser Family Foundation, which analyzed insurer data submitted to CMS. The rise in rebates is driven largely by individual market insurers who will pay pay $743 million in rebates this year. Rebates in the small group and large group insurance markets are similar to previous years, with expected paybacks of $250 million from the small group markets and $284 million from the large group markets. Insurance companies have until September 30th to start issuing rebates. The rebates stem from the Affordable Care Act, which limits the amount of premium dollars that can be used for administration, marketing, and profit. Individual and small group market insurers must spend at least 80% on health care claims and quality improvement. Large group plans must spend at least 85%. The largest rebates within the individual market will come from Centene, HCSC Cigna, and Highmark. The report's authors predict high rebates are likely next year as well. That's based on individual market that remains strong and profitable despite the recent elimination of the individual mandate penalty. The Daily News will be right back after this. Long-chain N3 fatty acid supplements, 
didn't appear to either decrease the risk of preterm delivery or increase the risk of late-term delivery. That's according to a multi-center trial of more than 5,500 women. Researchers at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute in North Adelaide conducted the study. The investigators say there's evidence that N3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids play an essential role in labor initiation. In the study, the women were randomized to either a daily fish oil supplement or vegetable oil capsules. The two groups took the supplement or placebo from before 20 weeks gestation until 34 weeks gestation or delivery. In the final analysis, there were no differences between the intervention and control groups in early preterm delivery. 2.2% of pregnancies in the intervention group versus 2% of pregnancies in the placebo group. And there were no significant differences between the groups in other outcomes, such as the rates of preterm spontaneous labor. The analysis did suggest a greater incidence of infants born very large for gestational age among women taking the fatty acid supplement. But that didn't lead to a greater rate of interventions, such as cesarean section or post-term induction. The findings appear in the New England Journal of Medicine. And finally today, adolescent suicides can be prevented. And clinicians, particularly in primary care, have a key role to play. That's the advice of Dr. Joan Osarno of the University of California, Los Angeles. She spoke in a webinar presented on the World Suicide Prevention Day to raise awareness of the latest research in suicide prevention and risk factors. Primary care providers are especially important, Dr. Asano says. Primary care doctors are the most trusted doctors for teenagers. That means primary care can be the first line screening to identify risk factors for suicide. Dr. Asarno adds that a close link with primary care can make a very big difference in helping kids get through these times. Studies have shown that when doctors and nurses are able to recognize suicidality and link to behavioral health care when needed, suicide attempts and ideation are reduced. Dr. Asarno notes that strategies including dialectical behavior therapy and cognitive behavior therapy have demonstrated success in reducing self-harm. Schools have a role in suicide prevention as well. Dr. Osarno cites a study showing that suicide attempts were significantly lower among teens who were exposed to a school-based youth aware of mental health program. Other research has shown belongingness to parents, predicted lower odds of suicidal ideation after controlling for depression, anxiety, and internalizing symptoms. Good relations with peers and lack of feeling like a burden on others weren't significantly associated with lower odds of suicidal ideation. Dr. Osarno says the ongoing mission for clinicians and schools and parents is to send messages of hope and that there is help out there. And that's it for today's daily medical news. Be sure to listen to the latest episode of the CardioCast and Post Call. CardioCast and Post Call drop new episodes every Friday. For MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews. As always on Fridays, we'll end by giving credit where credit is due. This week's stories were contributed by Alicia Gallegos, Bruce Jansen, Alex Otto, Sharon Worcester, Mitchell Zoller, Lucas Frankie, Bianca Negrady, Mark Lesney, and Christine Kilgore. Our editors include Kathy Scarbeck, Denise Fulton, Catherine Hackett, Katie Lennon, Jeff Evans, Glenn Williams, Richard Peasy, Therese Borden, Elizabeth Meshkati, Renee Matthews, Mark Lesney, Laura Nicolaides, and Mary Ellen Schneider. Our editor-in-chief is Mary Jo Dales, and I'm Terry Rudd. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.